Hello everyone, welcome to Social Justice Week and today's panel discussion, live from QUTV studios and in front of a live studio audience. I'm Nora Baldner. Years before TikTok and Twitter, mass media helped mobilize citizens to tell their stories and to take action. Today, we'll be talking about the evolution of media and social movements. Dr. Justin Coffey, Professor of History, and Dr. J. Matt Ward, Assistant Professor of History, join me to discuss how the media has played a strategic role in the fight for social justice. Our topics will include the Civil Rights Movement, QAnon, Hashtag Activism, GoFundMe, Change.org, and Facebook groups. Let's begin with Dr. Coffey and the history of media in the 20th century in the Civil Rights Movement. Thank you for joining us. Thank Dr. you so Coffey. much for having me here today, uh, Professor Valder and Dr. Ward. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. I'm going to be giving a, a talk here about the uh, evolution of the media in the 20th and into the 21st century. Um, I want to start out actually, we, we, we are here in Quincy, and the newspaper is the Quincy Herald Whig. And in the 19th century, newspapers were avowedly partisan. The, the newspaper, the Herald Whig, took its name that, because they were a Whig paper. They were aligned with a particular political party. Beginning in the 20th century, journalism became kind of a profession. And like the legal profession or the medical professions, journalists got training. And journalists began to see their role as uh, separate from opinion. That is, newspapers would report the news, but there would be places for opinions, the editorial page. And so the newspapers such as the New York Times or the Quincy Herald Whig would have news sections. And they would try to keep opinions from the news. And, and that was true when radio was developed in the 1920s. Radio stations would report breaking news, and then they might have commentators and such. And when you got into television, when the CBS, ABC, NBC had their television stations, then they were reporting the news and, um, again, trying to keep commentary out. Now, during uh, the 1960s, uh, 1950s and 1960s, uh, when the civil rights movement, uh, really the modern civil rights movement began, uh, there were some journalists who said that there are not two sides to the civil rights story. One is right one is wrong. And so when you saw uh, African Americans marching and being hosed because they were marching or being attacked at Selma, you know, a lot of journalists said no. The, the Bull Connor or the uh, Alabama National Guard that are attacking the, the protesters at Selma, there aren't two sides of the story. They're simply one side. And, and, and you saw in the 1960s in particular, uh, much of the media coming out and trying to advance the cause of civil rights. Now, the, at the time in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, uh, there was kind of a broad consensus in the country about where most Americans got their news. There were three television networks, uh, CBS, ABC, NBC. People turned in every night at 6.30 in the East or 5.30 at night to watch Walter Cronkite, Roger Mudd. And again, they saw their jobs as presenting the news in a very straightforward fashion. People got their local newspapers. I mean, everyone did. Every morning there was a newspaper outside and people read the newspapers. But again, there was an editorial page so people could uh, get different points of view. What you began to see during the 1990s was the proliferation of really a back to the 19th century with kind of a partisan or ideological spin on the news. The first and foremost you would see would be Rush Limbaugh with his uh, excellence in broadcasting and, and, and radio news talk, talk show hosts began to uh, offer really kind of a right-wing perspective 
on the news. So you began to see a breakdown. Also, at the same time, there was a challenge that maybe we shouldn't trust anything. Now, skepticism of the media has always been high. Of course, there should be. But once the internet came along, and things like the Drudge Report showed up, people then be could begin to pick and choose where they got their news sources. So instead of most Americans turning into Walker to Cronkite at night, they began to click on things. And what we know this on is confirmation bias. Americans, a lot of Americans now only go to websites that confirm what they already believe and what they want to hear. When you add that in with Fox News, which came along and avowedly said, we are going to be a right-wing network, you now have a whole host of sources that say you shouldn't trust anything what the media reports except for us. And people begin to tune into those. What that does is it further and furthers polarization and ideological division. And then, because people are seeking out their confirmation bias, it leads to things such as conspiracy theories becoming accepted. And, we, and we've seen that. There's always been a kind of a conspiratorial edge to American politics. Uh, the book is the, uh, uh, C. Van Woodward, I believe, or uh, the conspiratorial something in American politics. What is it? Um, uh, it's not Woodward, it's Hofstetter. I Hofstetter, think. yes. The paranoid. The paranoid style. The paranoid style of American politics. There's always been this way. But um, with, with Kana, uh, Kunan and this bizarre conspiracy about this pizza shop in Washington, D.C., we saw how far it can go. And because uh, we are now seeing even more of people cutting cable and, and, and a lot of people just not having a TV, they get their sources from the internet, they don't check to see if the sources are reputable, and they only go to things that, again, that they want to hear. So there has been an enormous breakdown in the way Americans uh, get their news. There are now, you're not getting it from the Today Show, your local news, and then the evening news. You're, you're getting it from the only things that you want to hear which, again, when people are inclined to believe the worst, well, there are places you can go. And so when this guy shows up with a gun looking for a basement in a pizza shop after the election, um, that's just kind of a logical outgrowth of this uh, polarization and an absolute decline in trust in the media which the same people have fomented, saying we should not trust the media, we should not trust the media, we should not trust the media, and that's how we got here. And I would argue also that um, the, it creates echo chambers where all you hear, and that's what you're saying, is all you hear is what you've clicked on and it bounces back and forth and there's never any other information coming in. Yeah, right? and, 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 and also, let's say if you watch Fox News, or if you watch MSNBC, they don't really have debate. They just have guests on who agree with the hosts. So you're not actually learning anything. There is no debate. Whereas, again, 30 or 40 years ago, you could turn into a Sunday morning talk show, or you could have your local newspaper would have three or four columnists, each with a different point of view. Well, if you do nothing but watch Fox News all day, you're never going to hear a different point of view, and the same with MSNBC. Well, and I definitely appreciate you talking about the lack of attention to local news because, you know, when people do have dinner parties and they're talking about national politics, I always say, what's going on locally? What's going on with your city council, your county board? And the lack of knowledge is frightening, and the loss of local media has contributed to that, so that's scary as well. Um, you know, right. it's very likely in, in by 2030, um, the majority of American cities won't have an actual hand-delivered newspaper, right. um, which is frightening. And again, with cord cutting, with a lot of people not having a television, they just don't watch the local news at night, so they have no idea 
what's going on with their city council, with taxation, with their local schools, that kind of thing. Right. All right, Dr. Coffey, thank you. Now, yes. Dr. Ward, what have various groups like Black Lives Matter and QAnon, how have they used social media to galvanize their activism now in the 21st century? Yeah, thanks for that question, Nora. I'm gonna take a very circuitous path uh, about answering it, because I wanna pick up where both of you were just talking about with uh, local news sources. This is something that's important to me because my father works for a local newspaper in my hometown of Amory, Mississippi, where I was born and raised. And we have conversations quite frequently about the, the dwindling amount of papers that they can get out and the stories that they struggle to find. And I think that speaks to something in general. I want to piggyback on what you were talking about, Justin. The, in the transition from the 19th and 20th century into the 21st century, we really see a, a, a lack of reliance on institutional politics. Mm -hmm. and, not only in America, but across the world with like uh, Occupy Wall Street or Arab Spring or the Hong Kong protests. Lots of people have become very distrustful of formal, institutional, mainstream ways of, of consuming information and they turn to their own interpretations and their own organization. And so they're using Facebook or Instagram or live streaming to organize these things. I think on the one hand that can be um, profoundly inspirational and on the other hand it can be very chaotic. And this is an ambiguous problem with digital activism because so much of it is leaderless. And I don't think that's inherently a problem every time. Uh, I, I do think, however, regardless of our political backgrounds or, or our beliefs, the, the recent waves of digital activism in the past few years should make us really uh, think very critically about how we analyze information, how we implement action based on that information, and how we relate to one another as human beings. Uh, because it's very easy to get online and hide behind anonymity and speak uh, very poorly about one another. And I think that really detracts or degrades from the fundamental uh, humanity of the other side, whatever that side may be. So online activism in recent years uh, and forum-based internet culture, I think is, has become a bastion of user-generated democracy and anti-establishment politics. And as you said earlier, Justin, that's, that's really been uh, a theme in American history and grassroots activism has been a theme in American history but now uh, the digital landscape I think has democratized information in a way that's rather unprecedented because anyone can get online and whether they give their name or not and say anything join a part of any group I mean careers are, are made and broken online these days um, and some scholars call this uh, slacktivism or clicktivism, you know, the idea that we can get online and post anything we want, like it, promote it, and then get this, you know, this dopamine rush, the simulation of participation that may or may not connect to real politics or reality itself, uh, depending on your perspective. So social media allows us to take our internal narrative and digitize it and make it into something that everyone can access. And I think this meta politics uh, can be confusing for some people because we've gotten to a point now where some of us may not be able to tell the difference between what's real and what is bathed in irony or detached from reality because we might have some Americans live streaming events that they're going to or uh, as we've seen recently incidents of police brutality and then we have some other Americans that might perceive those individuals as crisis actors or participating in shock theater that's meant to undermine democracy. Um, so I'm left with this question of, is digital activism a legitimate form of politics that can change the world, or is it uh, more of a personality-based satirical performance art? And I think both of those things can be true. And unfortunately, I think they can even be true at the same time uh, to make it all the more confusing. So the, the three questions that I ask myself today that I'm gonna try to get at briefly is, what even is digital activism? Because it doesn't look the same depending on who's using it. Uh, how useful is technology and what are its limitations? So to my mind, digital activism is a form of collective protest carried out online. And it doesn't necessarily always have to be collective, but it generally is. And it's generally operating outside the mainstream. And we've seen several forms of activism uh, come to the forefront in the past few years. 
uh, most prominent of which is probably the hashtag, right? You can use any term or idea you want and promote it and you get a group of people talking about it. Or recently people have been taking that and they take a hashtag and they'll put it on a post that has nothing to do with that hashtag to try to suppress that information and push it down. So you can kind of augment uh, the algorithm there. And some people have taken to calling it algorithm uh, uh, activism. So you can like a post, you can share it, you can watch it repeatedly to try to get that information to sort of surface above the cacophony of information that we're constantly getting these days. Uh, a more toxic version of uh, social media and digital activism we've seen is doxing, where people uh, yeah. try to find out someone's real identity and expose them to the real world and uh, often threaten them both online and, and in the real world. So. Uh, there are positives and negatives to people gathering on the internet and using it as a resource to organize themselves. So it's this morally complex topic, and I'll briefly just talk about some uh, organizations that I think fit uh, along a continuum of uh, the political spectrum in America today. Recently, with the um, police brutality surrounding the killings of Philando Castile or George Floyd or Breonna Taylor, we've seen an outpouring of digital media and, and digital resources uh, in pursuit of justice for them. And I've really been struck with how effective they've been, not only in visually documenting the incidents themselves, but also in uh, showing us how the crusades of justice have unfolded since then. And I've, I've, I think that they're particularly successful in what they've been trying to do. Uh, on the other hand, digital activism can be disconcerting. I mean, we've already talked about QAnon. It's sort of like this thundercloud that has a multitude of conspiracy theories in it and sort of pulls everything into its orbit. Um, I, I think that another prominent example is uh, Pepe the Frog. You know, Matt Fury was a comic illustrator who created Boys Club, the comic, uh, in the uh, around 2009. He put that on his MySpace, and within five or six years, Pepe had become like the everlasting meme lord of the entire internet and people on 4chan and other websites had begun to use that that you know innocuous cartoon character to support some pretty um, drastic right-wing ideas and once you put something on the internet it's really hard to control where it goes mm -hmm. um, so this leads me to think about how useful can technology even be because on the one hand we have this uh, evidence. We have footage that people are recording at protests or at political rallies and we can see what's going on. We don't have to rely on traditional news sources and we can organize ourselves in ways that we haven't seen before. Uh, and that seems to be very egalitarian, right? Um, you know, it doesn't cost anything to start a Facebook account. It doesn't cost anything to start an Instagram account. And anybody can get online. But I think we need to think more critically about that because uh, there's some trickiness to that, right? Not everybody has a computer or a smartphone or a data plan or even access to the internet. And I don't know about you two, but I, I don't have time to be on the internet all day either. That's a resource that a lot of people have. They can just be on the internet all day trying to shape the discourse. And so to, to talk about digital activism as the pinnacle of politics, I think kind of ignores the material questions that are embedded in it. Um, so we have, uh, to think more clearly about how useful technology is, but what its limitations are as well. Uh, that leads me to my last question. What are those limitations? I think, take smartphone witnessing, for example. Uh, people have been using that to document instances of police violence and, and rally people against that and, and reform that issue. And I think that's important and, and very critical. On the other hand, it does invite people to sort of uh, participate in this dark spectacle of state violence and where they consume these images but they don't necessarily have an articulate pathway toward reform and we have an abundance of misinformation uh, in the world too regardless of the live streaming that occurs we have people that comment on this endless, endlessly and turn it into memes and there's a lack of accountability for how we're thinking about information regardless of what the subject is and some people even commodify their perception of information and uh, the way that they share that information. That's often referred to as virtue signaling. 
and some people use their position to sort of denigrate others and say, I have the best way to present this. So uh, I want to wrap up by saying we need to be guarded about digital activism. It has uh, profound possibilities that I think are excellent. It also has tragic consequences if we're not responsible with it. So I think we need to use technology as a stepping stone toward expanded human dialogue and per personal interface because at the end of the day, the anonymity of the internet only gets us so far. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Nora. I think too, I think this, what both of you have said is really exposes the extreme need for media literacy. Mm -hmm. And if we start in elementary school, you know, it needs to start there, <clears throat> excuse me, and I know that <clears throat> there are a lot of programs that are starting media literacy and a lot of schools are starting media literacy in early, you know, schools and, and early grades. So I think that's what you both have said definitely points to that you know, need in our society for sure. So I get to join the conversation with a couple of um, positive examples of digital activism. Um, it has been around, you know, as you both have indicated for quite some time. It's just the mecha mechanism and uh, the way that it has been distributed. It's gotten faster and it's gotten easier, right? So I wanna talk about a couple of examples of the positive force of social activism and really how it's changing the way that we connect with each other. So first, just to back up for a minute, I wanna talk about um, advertising and marketing on social media. So the goal of social media and marketing is to sell a product, right? So if I'm selling shoes, I'm going to be using compelling images and text to show you my product, to get you to buy it. And the call to action at the end of my, say, social media campaign, or even just one social media post, uh, is where I'm going to make that conversion and where I'm going to have my success. And you have seen these call to actions. So, um, click here, order now, buy this, share this, right? That's a call to action. That's a digital activist call to action with you know, some uh, capitalistic um, uh, goals there. In activism, the call to action sounds a little bit different. So it's sign this petition, join our movement, or donate here. So same mechanism, same call to action, it's just pointing in a little bit different direction. So when you sell something you know, on social media, that is called a conversion. When someone clicks on your link and uh, people who are analyzing the marketing campaign behind it, that's called a conversion. Social activism actually creates conversions when people show up and when they sign up and when they donate. So the different platforms definitely have different nuanced operation and execution. So a call to action on Facebook doesn't necessarily look exactly like a call to action on TikTok or Snapchat mm -hmm. or Twitter, but again, the end result is the same. So I'd like to talk about one example uh, that we used at Quincy University, the Justice for Jazz rally in Washington Park. Now this was the spring of 2021, I believe. It's an example of a social media call to action. Jasper Evans was a student at Quincy University at the time. She was assaulted at a local bar. She reported it and a subsequent arrest of the bar owner at the time occurred. Many community members shared the pictures of Ms. Evans after the assault. News organizations covered the story and community members reacted. The video of, that you just saw of the rally in Washington Park showed the support for Evans. They brought signs, they marched in the park, and they actually wa they marched from Washington Park all the way to the barn. That was the name of the establishment at the time. I think it has changed names since that. But the event was organized and promoted and shared on social media. And you can see there was quite a crowd there at Washington Park uh, when this rally took place. Facebook groups is a way of organizing people around causes and interests, and it's one of the main tools that people are now using to rally support and get people to come to events, just like this um, Justice for Jazz rally that you are seeing right here. You probably see uh, recognized people there. This is another example of really local activism. So it is you know, taking something that happened in a local community using social media to put a location to the rally and to the effort and to have people congregate there. So another local and contemporary example as well is a similar rally held in Washington Park in support of a rape victim. 
She went public with her story after an Adams County judge reversed his decision to convict the man arrested for the assault. In this case, there was actually international media attention to Cami Vaughn's story. Social media and digital communication spread this Adams County case worldwide. So just like in the Justice for Jazz rally, there was also a march in Washington Park in support of Cami and also to raise awareness about sexual assault issues. Both people, both rallies, people showed up because they saw this activity and they clicked on a call to action on social media. Digital activism also can benefit fundraising and it can provide political pressure. So GoFundMe pages have been used for everything from paying to college to paying for medical bills. Digital platforms make it really easy to give money to political campaigns and not-for-profits and also community fundraisers. So one more example of digital activism uses Facebook and Change.org. Change.org is a platform that supports the power of the petition, right? We seem to have lost that a little bit where people would go door to door and say, would you sign my petition? We can get this on the November ballot, but it has gone digital as well. Groups can create the petition, they collect signatures for a show of support, and then they also can collect money. Most of the time the money is used there to boost that social media presence. So you're kind of almost paying for um, advertising for the petition itself. So in Quincy, there is a group called the Safe and Livable Housing Committee, and they are both using, they are using both Facebook and also change.org to raise awareness about the lack of oversight for unsafe and unlivable housing in Quincy. The change.org petition currently has about 164 signatures, digital signatures, trying to get people locally to be active, and they are asking for a rental inspection ordinance in Quincy. So that petition would then be presented to, say, the local governing bodies, the local city council here to, to urge um, those representatives to make a change. Also, the change.org petition calling for the resignation of the Adams County judge got 25,000 signatures. That's mostly because the media went international, it went everywhere. So those are just a few snapshots of local and current digital activism. Uh, the desire for people to work together to support a cause, to right a wrong, to shine a light in dark places. It's been the same for years, but it's just the way that we're doing it is now more widespread and a little bit more public. So. That's kind of my um, addition to what you both have been talking about, and I appreciate your insights on kind of how we got to this point. Now we would like to open up our discussion to our studio audience here. We've got some students at QUTV Studio, and I'm going to toss it to someone who has the first question, Madison Norris. All right, so I'm Madison Norris, and I'm a QUTV reporter, so I will be helping channel the questions. So the first question for the panel would be, how can our generation take these learned lessons from the media and start turning them into positive change? Jay Matt, that's a great question. <laughs> See, my generation, I'm a, a millennial, got in a lot of trouble for spending too much time online. But now I feel like with Gen Z, it's a thing that's pretty celebrated because um, they coordinate and communicate there very effectively. Um, I don't know if there's any specific lessons that we've learned just yet, because I feel like we're kind of learning as we go still, especially in light of uh, recent developments since 2016, of like how do we deal with politics and uh, opinions and the internet all going at once. Uh, my biggest response to that would be check your sources, check your sources, check your sources. I would agree with that too, and don't ever post anything that you haven't um, verified, that you haven't vetted, that you know to be true. And you know, obviously, and this generation actually is really good about being careful on social media, so I don't see uh, a real um, effort to try to dissuade or to try to um, you know, pull the wool over anyone's head. But I guess my advice would, would echo yours and just make sure that what you're sharing, what you're doing has a positive outcome because it can be very effective. Just have to make sure it's real and true and back it up with facts. All right, so next question. Please first state your name. Uh, my name is Evan White. And then what would your question be? My question is, um, 
With the history uh, that we've talked about, uh, how could it be used in, uh, for today's activism? Well, um, I, I think if, if you look at the 1950s and 1960s, um, the civil rights movement, um, the nonviolent approach was used as a strategy partly because the images were so horrifying of you know demonstrators being attacked that it, it actually molded public opinion in that a lot of people who might have not have been particularly sympathetic to the civil rights movement became so. And so the, the same kind of, of, of uh, something that, that J. Matt was talking about, um, you just have to channel your beliefs in, into kind of the right way using the right methods instead of it, I, I forget the word you used, but there was something you said it, it can, if it's used incorrectly, it can turn people against you. All right, so moving right along, we have another question. Um, first, state your name. My name is Bianca Johnson. And then what would your question be? My question is, how did groups like Black Lives Matter and QAnon change the way national movements operate? Uh, again, I feel like that's, uh, we're figuring that out as we go. I'm not sure anybody quite knows what the digital landscape and the political landscape is gonna look like uh, from this point moving forward. I, I, I'm going to take both sides of this issue and say there, there's reasons to be hopeful because we've got more people involved in the political process than ever before and people are investigating uh, police brutality or their government or anything you want to say for themselves. It's good to get people involved like that. On the other hand, um, because there's not a lot of media literacy or a willingness to question even one's own perspective about the media or institutionalized uh, government, uh, that people rely on faulty narratives and just sort of run with it and then we end up in some very chaotic places. So I think the jury's still out on how both of those movements are going to affect uh, reality moving forward, but I think those are the two uh, issues we can see. And I think what has really happened in, in, the, in the way that it has changed the way that we behave, it has com completely collapsed uh, the learning curve time. So back in the 50s, 60s, you know, you had to wait for the newspaper to be developed or, sorry, delivered in order to learn what was going on. Right now, we have this society of immediate reaction. So I think any campaign that has resulted in um, activism or marches or rallies or petitions, the, the learning curve of how it went and the analysis of what we do after the fact has really, really become quick and fast. And I think learning both good and bad lessons and how effective these campaigns or even these pop-up organic movements have become, I think that we all need to watch what they've done. How did society behave? What were the lessons learned after? You mentioned the, the pizza gate earlier, Justin, and I think that was a huge learning curve that someone could get so irate from watching something on social media that they would physically go to a pizza shop with a shotgun. That was incredible. Yeah. All right, so on to our next, um, state your name. Jay Hamill. And then what would your question be for the panel? Uh, how did movements get going before social media? Well, take the civil rights movement. In 1960, a group of four students at North Carolina at and were sitting around one, one evening saying, how do we advance civil rights? They decided, why don't we go to a local Woolworth, sit there and wait for us to get served. Word of mouth then spread. The answer is very slowly, but they could pick up over time very quickly because people would see images uh, in the newspapers and then with the radio and television, things like that. But there were things like direct mail, those, those, those kind of things. But 
most movements actually started in a very small, you know, with very small groups of people and then mushroomed. And movements can start with a woman taking a seat on a bus. Yeah. I mean, just small actions of, mm -hmm. in society can spark movements. Once what, what you said was right. The word gets out, people react, right. people tell stories to each other, yep. right? We're doing this all the same way. It's just digital has made it so much faster, so immediate, and so much more attention, right? Yeah, and you can trace uh, a lot of political activism all the way back to the revolution. People would go door to door, hey, we're gonna organize at this church, or we're gonna uh, rally at this barracks. I mean, just take a look at the history of the revolution in Boston and see all the street action that Americans took there. It's really just kind of grown from there. I'll credit Thomas Jefferson and the, the, the Anti-Federalists for really getting the, the press going uh, as, a, as a partisanized part of American politics in the 1780s and 90s. So, as you've said a few times, what we're seeing today is not really anything new, it's just the pace of it is so bewildering. All right, panel, so we have a couple more questions for you. Please state your name. My name is Eric Stafford, and my question is, what are some of the dangers of using social media to promote an event? Well, there's a lot of them, actually. Um, you know, sometimes it depends on what the actual movement or what the cause is. Um, I have heard of, you know, people are leery of putting something on social media because they don't want the wrong types of people to show up or the wrong groups to show up. We saw this a lot. Actually, we saw this in Quincy, um, you know, just after the election of 2016. And someone would say, let's go have a, you know, a, a freedom rally in Washington Park. But they didn't want protesters of the protest to show up. So they were limiting uh, the audience on social media. That brings us to Facebook groups. In order to get in a group on Facebook, the administrators of that Facebook group have to let you in. So there's gatekeeping, even on social media, for people to be, I'm only going to be in this group. I'm going to see what our group is doing, what our action is. But, but the danger is sometimes you could cause a bigger problem if you're trying to do something in person, right? You might be accused of starting a riot or mob rule. I mean, if 500 people show up and you have no, and you want a peaceful protest or rally or something, and then you post something, again, the wrong people see it, and they come there and they cause trouble just to make your movement look bad. That's a real danger. Yeah, I think we have to be very clear about what the purpose of the gathering is and mark that very clearly from the beginning. Uh, there's still ongoing controversy now about what the intention was behind um, the January insurrection last year. Mm -hmm. And all of the intentions of the individuals that were there were very clearly laid out on Reddit and I think 4chan as well. And uh, I'm not making a statement about that incident in particular, but we do need to watch exactly what we're saying the intent of our meetings and well, gatherings are. And there were so many levels to that because we even had people from Quincy who attended. Oh, wow. And I, I would think that they really thought they were going to a rally, a political mm -hmm. rally. Um, and then other things happened. So I think there's definitely layers, but mm -hmm. you know, people were engaged in different ways in especially that. And also Black Lives Matter, those, those marches, you know, there are accusations from both sides saying, well, you, you know, destroyed property. No, that wasn't us. That was someone else who showed mm -hmm. up to make us look bad. I mean, we've got all of this, you know, anecdotal evidence of what's going on in these, in these situations, right? Yes. Okay. All right. So please state your name and then ask your question. Hi, I'm Megan Ganniger, and I want to ask if, ask if you think that the pandemic played a effect on rallies during the citywide lockdowns. Well, I absolutely think it did because I know that people were nervous about gathering in person, uh, but we saw the tipping point where the cause was so much bigger than the risk. And so you saw a lot of people coming out and making a statement um, and getting criticized for even, you know, marching in public outside or, you know, trying to figure out how to navigate not only organizing for a, a message, but also organizing during a pandemic when you could be exposed to something. I, I was. I thought you were going with a different question about like maybe how, uh, questions about the pandemic and conspiracy theories online. I don't think we've seen anything more with various conspiracy theories and debating points than the pandemic itself. And that really led 
leads to a, a, a very um, challenge about experts versus online. I mean, uh, the uh, Dr. Fauci and all, all the others at the Institutes of Health versus people putting on Facebook that the vaccine causes blindness. Um, that, that's where I thought you were going with that. Um, well, and just because you have a YouTube video doesn't mean it's real yes, or right. Exactly. Right? It, yes, it, that's that's the case. Right. Yeah. I think the pandemic, um, whether people stayed home or not, it gave people a lot of time to think and access information, whether it was true or not. And then beginning in 2020 until now, we've seen a huge spike in membership and QAnon Facebook pages and things. And I think the, the isolation of just sitting at home and not having much to do, that contributed to a variety of ideas. And antisocial, yes, I mean, ideas, right, yes. And I also good. think the pandemic has, the election of 2016 started social media platforms to uh, self-regulate and mm -hmm. say, and mark um, posts as true or not true or what percentage of true. And I think the pandemic put that into overdrive. Yes. And I think definitely platforms are like, okay, we are responsible for making sure that our content, no matter where it comes from or who posted it, is verifiable, right? Yes, very much so, yeah. yes, yeah. All right, our last question for the day. Yes, panel, thank you. We are on to our last question. So once again, state your name and then ask your question. Hi, my name is Noah Gershman, and I was curious as to why conspiracy, conspiracy theorists gain a digital following. Well, right now in Ukraine, a video came out Sunday morning about a village that had been shelled and the Ukrainians came on it when they liberated it and found massive bodies. And yet there were all of these posts online about how we shouldn't believe this, how we should dismiss that there was Ukrainian propaganda. And I, I, the, the danger as always is you know, you were talking about lack of, you know, institutions. I mean, institutions, unfortunately, have, have a habit of lying in the mm. past, particularly about war and things such as this. But there are a lot of people who are denying that, that Russia has committed any sort of even illegal actions in Ukraine. And the, the Internet and Facebook and, and TikTok and, and Instagram all these like-minded people can now to go together and instead of them saying well maybe russia did do this maybe i should rethink my opinion all you have to do is click on again this confirmation bias and you will find sources that tell you no this is a hoax so unfortunately conspiracy theories are uh, being augmented because of social media not decrease which uh, you know I mean, with more information out there you would think would be the opposite but in fact it's not the case i would add to that that what's at the heart of every every conspiracy theory is a sense of disempowerment mm -hmm. that i'm being lied to that i'm being deceived i'm being misled and from that disempowerment grows you know, rage or in investigation or uh, uh, criticism. And th this idea that self-interpretation is more reliable than formal narratives that we used to, that formal narratives ha are established you know, cages to keep us from thinking or acting in ways that the state doesn't want us to. And that may be true in some cases, but oftentimes, uh, and this is definitely true with the rise of social media, conspiracy theories uh, center around personality politics. Uh, there are certain people that gain a huge following, not so much based on what they say, but the performative ways that they say it. And people really like to listen to a certain speaker uh, and they gain uh, a lot of notoriety because of that. Or if they can do a good dance on TikTok. Yeah. Right? They get followers. All right. I mean, I mean, uh, we, we don't, I mean, there, there, there are, particularly three or four people out there who have just become celebrities and million and they're just peddling things like student shot at an elementary school in Connecticut was a hoax. Mm -hmm. Dangerous. Yeah. Dangerous. Yeah. Dangerous. Yes. Right. Well, thank you to Misha Ferguson-Smith for organizing this Social Justice Week. 
Thank you to our studio audience for excellent questions. And thank you to Dr. Coffey and Dr. Ward for joining us today. Find us on social media. And one thing I can say is that if you follow QUTV, everything we broadcast is true. So follow <laughs> us on QUmedia.net. For everyone here at QUTV, have a great day.